Let me try and move across to the cultural side and introduce Armand Blavois, who is uh, one of our great uh, professors of evolutionary developmental biology. Now, I mentioned just at the beginning about the importance of biology in terms of metaphor for the evolution of societies um, and the economy. And Armand, you've been working on uh, understanding the forces that shape culture and uh, using data and trying to map and understand in a social and cultural and analytics lab what is happening. And you know, the consumer side of, of this discussion needs a voice. And, and it needs an understanding and evidence base. You've written a very sumptuous book, uh, The Lagoon. Uh, it really touches into uh, how science has evolved uh, way back from Aristotle. So uh, I will flag that for, for those of you who like reading uh, wonderful uh, books. 2014, I think that came out. You can get it as I did on Amazon. So uh, Armand, would you like to share some ideas? Uh, perhaps, I, I'm not sure if they're a counterpoint, but at least a voice from um, the consumer and the cultural side. And, and then we'll try and have a, an extended discussion. Thank you. So thanks a lot, David. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so perhaps I should begin by putting my credentials on the table. I'm not an entrepreneur. I've never started a business. I've never even worked for one. Not large, not small. I'm an academic, and I've been one for all my life. And yet, I'm going to claim that I know more about innovation than any of you. And I mean, and I know a whole bunch of you come with titles like heads of innovation, and we have the vice president for innovation, and we have a great entrepreneur over here who's built up several companies, any of which have a number of gone bust, and he's almost crashed the Western economy at various times. But setting all that aside, I'm going to suggest that I actually do know more about innovation because my science is actually the one science that there is about innovation, and that is evolutionary biology. So evolutionary biology, as David has very kindly set up for me, is fundamentally a science about explaining where all the amazing stuff in the world comes from. And by that I mean, of course, organic stuff, all those amazing creatures that we see on Blue Planet and Living Earth and so <laughs> forth, you know, doing all their weird things. Now, it's long been perceived that there's somehow a parallel between that science, which is a huge science, and underpins all of modern biology, and the science of, um, well, it's not a science, and, uh, b and, and the, the problem of innovation in economies. Uh, let me try to persuade you that that's in fact true. So I've called my talk the innovation algorithm, and um, I, that sounds very catchy, but actually it's a really, really simple idea. In fact, it's an idea that you're completely familiar with, but it's an idea that was originally due to Darwin in 1859, when he actually explained where all the stuff in the world comes from. The innovation algorithm, it's really banal, but it's also very beautiful, has three simple ideas, that new things come from inheritance, variation, and selection. By inheritance, I mean the genetic material that we pass on to our offspring. By variation, I mean recombination and mutation. By selection, I mean some force to select out the fit from the unfit. Now, that simple idea is, of course, the recipe, the only recipe that exists for innovation in the, in the commercial world, in the world of culture. When we make a thing, the simplest thing, and it could be a PowerPoint presentation or a jet engine, what we do is we begin by borrowing from somebody else, <coughs> right? We borrow, copy, steal, plagiarize, whatever we can, as long as it's legal, even when it's not, and we take it and we mix it up, and that's called recombination, or as biologists like to say, sex. And we take that, and occasionally we have a novel idea of our own, that's mutation. We sort through that process in our desks, that's selection, and then we chuck it out into the world where it lives or dies, more often than not dies, but sometimes flourishes and makes us a lot of money. And everybody starts that way. Yeah, even Naveen Jain, he's not going to the moon, at least he couldn't, unless there were a NASA before him. So, there is, 
in evolutionary biology, a vast science. However, innovation, this simple principle, hasn't been cashed out into a, a real science. There's no mathematics of innovation. It's, there should be a science somewhere between economics on the one hand and cultural studies on the other, something that actually tells us in a really rigorous way how we should go about inventing stuff and where new stuff comes from. But there isn't. And the question is, why not? And I think the reason is, and it's a little bit of a counterintuitive one, I mean, it's a bit surprising, really, is that partly because uh, the things that people make haven't actually been seriously studied. We need to get all the stuff that people make. I mean, all the cultural objects, you know, from vacuum cleaners to, 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 to books, uh, and, and we need to measure them. And if we could measure them, we could actually begin to quantify what is innovative. Just think about this. If, we, if I say that this phone is more innovative than that phone, I mean, you and I might, if we investigated the guts of those phones, sort of come to some sort of an agreement. But tell me, how do we actually say that in a scientific, quantifiable way? Well, if we can't even do that, then we don't even begin to have a science of innovation. And yet I think we can. And let me show you about what I mean. So this diagram is, uh, is about pop music. So I still study worms a little bit, but actually I've sort of taken a bit of a shift. So what we did here is we got 17,000 songs which constitute the US Hot 100 from 1960 to 2010. So we took those 17,000 songs and we boiled them down. We measured them. We measured the chords. We measured the, 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 uh, the timbres, all the qualities of the music that you can possibly imagine. And we did this, of course, computationally, because that's what you can now do, right? We took all those things, we boiled them down, and we, got, and, 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 and we measured the similarity of all the different pop artists, 5,000 of them who have been in the charts relative to each other. And we constructed this diagram, which for kind of obvious reasons, I call the penis of pop. <laughs> so what does the penis of pop actually show you? Well, the left testicle over here, that's all, that's rock and roll. Basically, it tells you that there's a whole bunch of artists who are really similar to each other, and I've colored them in purple, that's rock and roll. And on the right, opposite them, we've got uh, um, sort of soft pop, ballads, that kind of thing. And then down here, what we have is that's country and western. This is R&B, and I'm not being cute when I say that the phallus, that's, that's hip hop. <laughs> so why is it hip hop? Why is hip hop up here sticking out like that? And the reason is actually relatively simple. It's because hip hop is the most innovative kind of music that there has been in the history of American popular music, at least since 1960, which is when our measurements began. So what the algorithm does is it measures, it lays out the songs and the artists according to how similar they are to each other, so they're more different from each other. So what you can see here is that what we can do is we can now take large quantities of cultural objects and we can measure them. And if we can measure them, then we can begin to do science with them. And I'm going to suggest to you that there's a whole new science here, and that's what I want to talk about. So one, one, we can do so much with this. So one of the things we can do is we can look at the history of pop. So take a look at this. This measures, from 1960 to 2010, the frequency of thrashing guitars in American popular music. You know what I mean. Da -na 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 -na, like that, right? And what you can see is it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up. What you're looking at there is the rise, the fall, the rise, the fall, and the rise of rock and roll. And I suggest to you that that we can do now, we can quantify that, and we can, and essentially all commentary on the history of culture up to now has been rendered obsolete. So, you say, well, that's kind of cute. I mean, you know, it's sort of fun. Um, but, you know, we can do, what else can we do with this? Well, uh, we published a paper on this in 2015, and. Uh, the BBC got some news, and the BBC asked us to do a, a program about it. They approached us, and they said, uh, can you do the same thing for the UK charts? And we said, sure, no problem. And uh, we took the data, and we analyzed it. And I've got to say, we ran into a little bit of trouble, because one of the things we did is we investigated what happened in 1964. So 1964, it's a time when the music is changing really, really fast. This is when rock and roll is coming in, and all, it's all becoming much more aggressive and sort of uh, harder edged. And of course we asked ourselves, yeah, but what were the Beatles doing, right? 
could, I mean, it's an obvious question, right? They're the biggest band in the world, the world at this time, they're conquering America. We measured them, and what we found is that actually they're really, really average. Or, as I put it on national television, when the Who, the Stones, and the Kinks were changing the face of British popular music, Lennon and McCartney were writing ditties for prepubescent girls. It was not the best, it was not the most charitable way to put it. And two days before transmission, the, uh, the, day, the Sunday Mail splashed with this, uh, with this article. Top scientists insist Beatles had virtually no influence and offers bizarre diagram of proof. There was something like 728 comments on the online Sunday Mail, nearly all of them hostile. My inbox was flooded for, for, for weeks. It reminds me that I'd forgotten of a, a very basic tenant of British public life. Never, ever, ever mess, mess with Liverpool. <laughs> Liverpoolians are very sensitive about these things. So what can you actually do with this stuff? I mean, it's nice to do, and it's nice to look at the history of, of, of popular music, that you can reconstruct it in this way, but surely you want to do something more. And I think you can. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So one of the things that, that the BBC asks us to do is, is, to, is to look at something called BBC Introduction. So if you're a, a music, if, you, if, you, if you're a musician in Britain, and you're making original music, no matter who you are, you can take that music and you can upload it to a website run by the BBC called BBC Introducing. And the promise that the BBC gives to you is that a DJ will listen to it, and if they like it, they'll play it first regionally, say on BBC Radio Kent Introducing, and if they really like it, they'll send it to London where it'll be played on BBC Radio One Introducing, and if it's really good, it'll get, you'll get to go to Glastonbury and be on the BBC Introducing stage. So it's a great idea. It's a way for the BBC to keep track of all the music that's happening out there and foster talent. I mean, it's a really wonderful thing. But there's just one problem. They, you get, there are about 2,000 hours per month of music which are uploaded to this website, and the BBC has to listen to all of it. At least that's the promise. And the problem, of course, is that most of it is terrible. I mean, there's almost very little of it has even the remotest chance of getting out there and being of any commercial interest. So they asked us if we could do better. So we said, yeah, we'll give it a try. So what we did was this. We took a machine learning algorithm and we trained it on the charts as it is over the last year or so. So we taught the algorithm what was successful now. And having done so, we released it on some 5,000 songs from BBC Introducing, and we said, okay, go fetch. Go fetch the songs that are most similar to the charts now. And what we found were these guys, the Modern Strangers. So, Not bad. I mean, here's the thing. We were able to pick these guys and a bunch of others straight out of this morass of music without actually listening to a note. And the tools we were using were just straight off the shelf. I mean, it was really revelatory. And what is even more remarkable, given that the theme of this evening is, compl this evening is complexity, is that it turns out, as you may imagine, that there are many different ways to be successful in the charts, right? Many different kinds of songs are successful. And the top three, four, five songs, they were all very, very different. One was a sort of a pop, you know, rock and roll song like this, another one is a, a hip hop song and so on, and yet they all somehow were picked out by the algorithm as being successful. I mean, it was a remarkable testament to sort of, to the power of machine learning. So, what are the implications for this kind of technology? Well, if we can measure everything, everything in culture, I think it's gonna have a huge impact upon the academy, the universities, upon the way in which we think about knowledge. Ever since the 17th century, since the rise of the scientific revolution, there has been a grand gulf between the sciences, the natural sciences on the one hand, and the humanities on the other. 
The natural sciences study the natural world, the humanities study culture. And we use numbers and they don't. That's going to change. There is going to be a new unified science of culture at which links economics and the natural sciences and culture all, to, all together. At least, I think there's going to be a, something like that, a grand unified marriage. I mean, it's also possible that as the scientists pile into studying culture, now that we can measure everything, and we can measure everything because everything is digital, all culture is digital, it's also possible that the humanities will resist. But if they do, I think we'll go over them like an armored division. And the reason is because if you have the numbers, the numbers always win. Science, whoever's got the technology, always grabs the intellectual high ground. What about businesses? What implications does that have for you? So if you're a content provider, you know, you're a publisher, you're a record company, you know, you're making, you're an ad company, you're doing, you're putting out vacuum cleaners, whatever. I mean, you're putting out designed objects, and most of you are. It's very clear that the days in which people, executives, made those decisions by what to put out there according to their gut feelings, what acts to sign, what books to publish, what designs to put out there, those are going to pass very quickly. If you're a major publisher and you don't have machine learners pulling stuff out of the slush pile, very soon you're going to have them. And we can be sure, it's all a little bit obscure, what the big, media comp the big tech media companies such as Google and Apple and Netflix are exactly doing, but what we do know is that they've bought up a slew of analytic companies, so they're certainly doing it. And yet, in my experience, there's a lot of people who haven't even begun to think about it yet. So what about the creatives? I mean, we all sort of think about ourselves as creatives. How's this going to affect us? I mean, it may seem that the outlook for musicians is, is rather bleak. And I guess it's kind of true, but, uh, you know, well, you can always argue, as, you know, people, in t people at the BBC did when I presented them with this, this, this results of BBC, our analysis of BBC introducing, they said, you know, you can never actually replace the DJ. He said, well, maybe not, but, Maybe we don't have to. Take a look at this. I diss the Beatles, but I actually kind of like them. I mean, they were sort of genius, right? Can't possibly replace them. Recognize the song? Nah. The reason you don't recognize the song is because, although the video, was taken from strawberry fields. I just got it from the web. The audio was made by machine, by Francois Pache at the Sony Labs in Paris. He had a machine learning algorithm based upon feeding an entire Beatles corpus into the machine al learning algorithm and then generating an indefinite number of songs. That is the future of art. Thank you. Uh, equally challenging, I think, from um, a cultural perspective. Um, let's just indulge in a few questions and comments directly to you. Um, can I start off? Um, inheritance, variation, selection are your ingredients for yep. um, the innovation algorithm. I, I like it. Except that I well, believe... I, I go, no, 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 no. Okay. We'll come to you in a minute, Naveen. Uh, hold him. on. Hold on. I want to ask, when you come to machine learning, how you avoid regressing to the mean, how you avoid um, selection just becoming some averaged out um, oh. blandness? Oh. Uh, yeah. So there's two, two answers to that. So the first is that, uh, as I suggested, machine learning algorithms at the best, right, when they work well, and of course, you know, they are becoming increasingly sophisticated, and we're talking about many different te techniques here. They're capable of dealing with very complicated success landscapes so that you're not just picking out one successful thing, you're picking out many possible solutions, as indeed in the charts, as I suggested. 
But there is one major weakness, which I didn't allude to, but which is absolutely true. Namely that to use a machine learning algorithm in picking out the stuff that's going to work, you have to train it. So only the things that have worked in the past, it has, so you can only teach it on the basis of what's worked in the past. You can, and, and, and it's only going to pick out things which have worked in the past and therefore which may work tomorrow. But of course, it'll, those things will work tomorrow and they'll work the day after, but it doesn't mean that they're going to work indefinitely. Indeed, we know they're not. And the reason is because culture and the economy and evolution, organic evolution, are all inherently chaotic systems. That's the limitation. Great. Let me just see if, there are, if we've tickled any questions or comments. Yes, please. That's a beautiful question. Uh, so the answer is, I'll try to keep it brief. There is from social psychology a body of work, and it's called the Wundt curve. And the Wundt curve, invented by a guy called Wundt, and this is just from the lab, right, says that there's an optimal amount of satisfaction that from things that are on a sort of a scale of boring to crazy, right? Too boring, people don't like. Too crazy, people don't like. There's an optimal thing, the Wundt curve. And it peaks somewhere in the middle, yeah? So you can show that experimentally. So the, you can or should be able to do that here in data and <coughs> see it. And some of our analyses suggest that we see just such an effect. Let me show, tell you, for example, let me try to give an example. So if we study the evolution of rap, how it increases over time, what we find is that it increases, but it, it increases around, wiggling around an equilibrium that is moving all the time. And the reason that we, what we interpret that as happening, the reason we think behind that is that at any given time, the American consumer, they liked some rap, but not too much. And the amount of rap that they liked changed over time. So in other words, the wound curve is sort of shifting up. So absolutely, you can, in principle, measure that. And I mean, that is a whole science area waiting to be made. Yeah. One more. Chris? Pick out the great entrepreneurs, yeah. the future entrepreneurs. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. I, I mean, I personally disagree with a lot of what you have said. So you, you are dissenting with a lot of what I have said. You know, well, so the reason I'm saying is that because it's very <coughs> incremental, and the reason is it, you never be able to look at the paradigm shift. So if you think about you know moving from a horse cart to cars, there's no algorithm would have picked that out or moving from the things to iPhone when everybody believed you have to have the buttons to be able to dial, to completely get a paradigm shift to, or say to uh, VR or AR. Those paradigm shifts, when they happen, they don't happen because you are incremental at that time. And that's where the nature is really, really poor innovator. It does a great job in isolation. It does a great job on incrementalism but it does a very poor job on a massive disruptive paradigm shift. So, so let, let's turn yeah. that into a question, Armin. Yeah. Um, and, and it relates very much to Chris's one. Uh, you've got 120,000 data set. Um, you are processing. Can you find nonlinear, um, non-incremental 
actions, or do you even disagree oh, with the question? Yeah. So here's the thing. So, <coughs> our, our, I mean, this is the fundamental problem. Should we say it's the th problem of the theory of success, right? So you give me your data, I'll be able to pull out statistically entrepreneurs who are better than average, right? No doubt about it. Uh, you know, if, if if your data are, are, are any good and if they're, they're they're any size, sure, absolutely. Will I be able to pull out the future Bill Gates, the future Naveen Jain? I don't think so. And I'll tell you why, and this is exactly, and this applies to pop music too. I can predict a song that is going to do better than most, and better even do even the top 1% of, of songs that do best. But you have to realize that in pop music, and as an entrepreneur's, just measured by income and company sizes, the distribution is immensely skewed, right? Uh, I mean, just to give you an example, you know, in, I have YouTube data for one week, for all the songs that entered into one week onto YouTube, uh, and that's something like 2,000 songs. And the highest rated song was, that happened to be the week in which Adele's Hello went in. At the end of the week, she got 384 million views. The lowest, least song was two, which suggests that some guy wasn't even watching his own video. I mean, you know, I mean, that tells you the range. And of course, the vast bulk of them are down there at the bottom, right? This is just, you know, the power law function of success, which is just universal. And I don't believe that there is actually any deterministic force that will enable you to predict that. I think that that is largely stochastic, actually. Yeah. Uh, or at least I'd be amazed if that were otherwise. 